right, it's good afternoon, Ghana. You're welcome, and uh, thank you for joining in the show. So, well, last, last, like we did last week, today we have another guest, a special guest, who is a seasoned politician. When I talk about a seasoned politician, you understand that guy has been around. So he's been around for years and has played his part in the political terrain, has contributed his quota for some time now, but he still has energy to go on and says that he's not ready to hold the fort for the MPP by being the general secretary for the party. And as I said before, if you say that you want to be the general secretary for the party, that is a very big deal, especially for a party like the NPP. So I'm talking in the person of uh, the former honorable member of parliament, Frederick Opare Ansan. He holds a lot of experience or a number of experiences to his name. And there is one thing that I want to find out from him. If you are interested, you also will join me. Why is internet so expensive in Ghana? He will be here to answer those questions. So, well, in his faith of restoring the grassroots faith in breaking the aid, how does he intend to do that? We'll hear more from him when we return from this break. I am Ani Ifua Ampof. We'll be back shortly. So it's time with aspirants on Good Afternoon Ghana. And uh, uh, we help you make the decisions as far as elections are concerned, both in the local political party and on the national level. So today we're spending time with a former honorable member of parliament. He was uh, for member of parliament for Suhum constituency, actually for the fourth and the seventh parliament. Honorable, you're welcome. Good afternoon. Am I right? The fourth to the seventh. To the yeah, seventh. So four terms. Yeah. Yes, four terms, yes, to yeah. the seventh parliament. How was that? It was good, thank you. Actually, it was good. It was good because I know you were on the Equus Parliament for about how many years? Nine well, years. Nine years, yeah. About nine years. Yeah. So, well, let me take you through just a snippet of his profile, and then we all have an idea of the man we're going to talk to, and then it will also guide us in our questions. So, the man we're talking about is Frederick Oparian's profile. He says that Frederick Oparian was born on the 5th of September 1968. He has extensive experience in the telecom, political, and corporate environment. He studied his ordinary, uh, sorry, yeah, ordinary level at Nkoko Secondary, uh, where he passed with the distinction. Now, he succeeded to pursue his advanced level as Presbyterian Boys Secondary School, Legon. He was admitted at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and he attended school. <laughs> it was of science and technology where he earned his bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering. Honorable Frederick Oparian Sa has undertaken extensive training programs along his levels seminars. Now, these include seminar of uh, African telecom managers in Erdenberg, Scotland Communications Policy Conference, African Telecom Summit, Lucent. Lucent Solutions in Copenhagen, Denmark, EMX 2500 Operations uh, and Maintenance, Chicago, USA, World S Summit for Information Society, that's uh, W. Uh, that's how you pronounce it, WSIS, yes. <laughs> Tunisia, and then uh, CTO Connecting Rural Africa, Abuja, Nigeria. Global Telecom Meeting 2007, Washington, D.C., USA. Goes on to say, Global Symposium of Regulators in Thailand, Regional Seminar on Contribution of the Parliament of Sierra Leone to the National Reconciliation Institutional Reform and Development Agenda, April 2009. Attended the IPU resource person. Okay, attended as IPU resource person, seminar on the contribution of parliament to peace and reconciliation in Uganda, October 2009. Attended as IPU resource person, let's go on. On the corporate front, he has also served uh, as uh, managing director and uh, general 
manager of Disconvert, Disconvertel, Disconvertel Ghana Limited, and Third Real Ghana Limited, respectively. Uh, he has also served as technical manager for Celtel Limited, remember Kasapa, and operations manager for transactions management services. He has served as stations engineer and consultant to multimedia, all right, broadcasting and crystal communication, respectively. Frederick O'Brien served as a uh, and continue to serve on the number of boards, which includes but not limited to these: Ghana Internet Service Providers Association, GESPA, Ghana ID Company, Discovery Tel, Ghana, Ristel, and then we have Guinea. That's in Guinea. Ghana Airport Company and others. In uh, okay, so Paul Adamoche is your friend. Okay. <laughs> okay. So in 2020, 2021, he was a member of, uh, a member and acting chairman of the Council of Ghana uh, Communication Technology University. He is a 16 year veteran of Parliament of Ghana, where he represented Suhum constituency. He served on several committees, including Finance and, and Business Committee in Parliament. He also served as a chairman of the Select Committee on Communications in the Seventh Parliament. Additionally, he has served as a member of Ghana's delegation to ECOWAS Parliament Abuja from to, uh, August 2011 to February 2020. Indeed, his parliamentary records of high, highest service and this include his service as a minority chief whip. Uh, from August 2007 to January 2009, he served as Deputy Minister of Communication. He has served as a consultant to the inter-parliamentary unions on several occasions. In Parliament, he was a consensus builder and was respected by both sides of the divide. He is one of the few people to be commended by the Member of Parliament for Ibuakwa South. And now His Excellency President Nanada Danko Akufuado in a handwritten note on the sale of Ghana Telecom, uh, which read, Honorable Minister, that was impressive performance. Well done. Okay. Okay. Oh, where is my... Uh-huh. All right, good afternoon, Ghana. And um, so, Frederick Oparianza is with us on the platform. If you have been in Ghana and you haven't heard the name Frederick Oparianza, you were in Ghana, but you weren't in Ghana. <laughs> that, that's in brief what I can tell you. You're welcome once again. Good afternoon to you. Thank you, Annie. Right. So, how did you feel when the then uh, Member of Parliament for Ibuakwa South told you that was an impressive performance? Um, that was then a very senior member of parliament. Right. He was uh, in his third term then, and I was uh, uh, in my first term. Right. And indeed, uh, that day when I stood up to debate on the sale of Ghana Telecom, uh, I had points of orders from uh, then uh, Dua Jaho, who was a member of parliament then, mm -hmm. uh, former President Mahama, who was a member of parliament then, Speaker Alban today, uh, Minority Leader Aruna, Edward Salia, the late uh, former communication minister, they all gave me points of order because you remember this was a major, major topic. The late President Mills had even embarked on a demonstration against the seal. But I took all their points of orders on and debated successfully. And so for the recognition that I received then from uh, the member of parliament for Buakwa uh, South, uh, Nanado, I uh, felt that I had done something right in, in the debate that I did that day. And till this day, I carried a note around with me. <laughs> you know, when you were mentioning the names, I mean, most of them I was, I, I remember at that time I was, uh, I was corresponding in parliament. So me too, I'm feeling proud, Kakra. You've been around for a while. I've been around for some yeah, time yeah. now. <laughs> anyway, so the question that I actually wanted you to respond to is why is internet expensive in Ghana? <laughs> Well, uh, generally, you would um, know that in the sub-region, um, Ghana has one of the cheapest um, costs for data. Um, luckily, we have a number of uh, submarine cables that are landing 
on our beaches. So there is high competition amongst them, which drives our uh, data prices a little mm -hmm. lower. But if you want to compare us to, say, the United States or the uh, Europe, mm -hmm. uh, you would find that the core internet service, these, this is where they all reside. And so uh, for a lot of users, accessing these services is a simple matter of going over their local uh, area network. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, you go over mm -hmm. your local area <clears throat> network here to access internet, and it first hits the service at your service provider. See, mm -hmm. if you're on MTN or uh, another network and you try to access internet, your local service provider is where you hit first. If you want the services from Google or other service providers, it will then go through the submarine cable and hit either Europe or Americas where those servers are. But for those who um, reside on the same continent where the servers are, it's just a matter of going over their local area uh, network. And so it drives their prices quite low. The higher cost is because we have to traverse the submarine, uh, optical submarine uh, uh, cable, which costs some money to uh, put in place. And there is limited access on it. And so there is competition uh, driving those uh, prices also. So is up. it the submarine cable that is making the internet expensive? Essentially, it is the cost to our service providers, which they try to recover and then also have their margins uh, on top. If you look at the cost of uh, bandwidth mm -hmm. across the submarine cable, you will realize that somehow the operators are transferring those costs onto us. And this is not something that um, government or uh, the regulatory authorities can do much about, except if we find ways of locating a lot of our local content here. If, for instance, we have the uh, .gh domain, mm -hmm. and instead of all of us uh, doing Google Mail and other mail services, we decided that we will latch onto mail services that are located here. And when I send you an email, it doesn't have to get routed around the whole world before it comes back to you and your response also going around the whole world before it comes to me. Then the local exchanges could be working and making things uh, a little less expensive for us. But we all love to have uh, uh, gmail.com, at, at gmail.com, and at, uh, if you will, uh, extensions that do not reside on servers here. So it is the nature of the service that uh, we are accessing, which is making it a that's, little bit expensive. That's making us spend a lot of data? Everybody who accesses the internet spends the same amount of data, but it is the distance that our data has to cover. I, I really want uh, the, the, uh, the, the person on the street to understand what goes on, because we all complain. Okay. And I'm reading this uh, from the techcable.com. Yeah. It says internet costs per region in Africa. Other African countries that charge mobile internet subscribes less than $1 to browse the web and run mobile apps uh, are Ghana, that's $0.66, Libya, 0.74, Tanzania, 0.75, Mauritius, 0. Um, 0.75, Nigeria, 0. 0.88, Cameroon, 0. 0.90, and Senegal, 0. 0.94. So in that, Ghana is about the cheapest. Precisely. Yeah, apart reports, from probably which, Libya. Where, apart from Libya. Yeah, where it, you probably have the state um, uh, subsidizing in there. You will notice that Ghana is about the cheapest, like I was saying. Even for places like Mauritius, which uh, is a bit tech advanced, uh, they still are more expensive than, than Ghana. So like I said, regionally, we are one of the cheapest because we have a number of um, uh, cables passing through here. If you took like Togo and some of the landlocked countries, they probably have just access to one uh, submarine cable. And so it makes their services very expensive. So when we have uh, multiple submarine cables, it's going to be cheaper? It makes it cheaper. There's competition. They are all carrying uh, bandwidth, which they want to offload to the local population. And so the competition amongst them drive their prices uh, down. Are we likely to get there soon? I don't know yet uh, of any major um, submarine cable that is still coming to pass through Ghana. Mm -hmm. If I recollect, uh, GLOW uh, was here, there was main one, um, and then the very first cable, I've forgotten the name, that 
came to Ghana. So we have about three landing points or so already in Ghana, which um, is good. So Glow Submarine Cable is working? I, I think it should be working. No. If, if my... Uh, I, I. <laughs> Anyway, I'm not going to go into Glow's business. But, but don't forget that Glow's submarine cable is a different business entity well. than their cellular network. It's not the same operation. Mm. There's a different entity, I believe, which is running the, the submarine cable. And you know, I remember so clearly because I was at the launch. Yeah. When Glow yeah. was talking about a submarine cable, cable and then yeah. we're hoping that yeah. it's going to do magic. But I mean, yeah, I know. it turns out to be, well, I, I can understand the competition. <laughs> so South, Kenya, South Africa, which with advanced mobile infrastructure and high internet traffic, fall far behind the top 100 list with charges of $2.25. Eh, I wonder if they're able to browse. Yeah. And uh, $2.67 per uh, gigabyte of data, respectively. So the cost of the data, these two countries, however, is cheaper than the global average of $4.07, according to the report. South Africa and Kenya are considered competitive mobile markets with the price of these wealthy nations not necessarily considered expensive by customers. I'm asking you this because of your experience, vast experience within the telecom That's right. sector. How do you describe our telecom sector? Our telecom sector is very vibrant. Um, I wish some of the other uh, competitors would have lived up to expectation. As we all know, um, I don't think a supply exists anymore. Um, I've seen Airtel and uh, Tigo merge and then leave, um, if my memory serves me right. I think they uh, left their stock with the government or something of the nature. So really, um, what you have right now, and Glow, you were, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't even want to talk about I mean, Glow. Yeah. Glow hasn't also lived up to expectation in Ghana. So the competition that we are left with really is um, Vodafone and MTN. And, and today, uh, which, will you praise what we did with Vodafone? Which is I where I was it. going. That. On hindsight, everybody should agree now that the sale of Ghana Telecom to Vodafone with the introduction of the kind of muzzle that they brought in has helped uh, the country. And <laughs> if my memory serves me right, the argument was that can we at least have a stake in one of the sectors? We didn't have a stake in, 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 we only sold 70% mm -hmm. of Ghana Telecom. We only sold 70%. Yes, we did not sell 100%. So we still own the 30%. <laughs> oh, no, but you should be proud of this. And, well, um, don't forget, at the time, that was the biggest transaction ever. $900 million. We had, Ghana had never done a transaction on that scale. Even the first euro bond, which Ghana did during the same period, was $750 million. Five years before, the then NDC administration had sold 30% of Ghana Telecom for just about $30 million to Telecom Malaysia. Mm -hmm, we came mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. took the shares back, worked on Ghana Telecom, repackaged it, and by 2008, we were selling the enlarged Ghana Telecom for $900 million. That was something. But if we could repackage it yeah. and make it that attractive for $900 million, why couldn't we repackage it and manage it ourselves? But that had always been the challenge. Um, where was government going to even have the kind of capital that is at play in the telecom industry? I don't think that uh, government with its, all its troubles, yeah. okay, in providing for social services and the rest, was uh, well placed. The government itself at the time had gone for some bonds called the Euroco bonds mm -hmm. back then, about 200 uh, million dollars mm -hmm. to try and refinance Ghana Telecom's debts. So it was all part of the, the package when we were selling uh, Ghana Telecom. It was mm -hmm. part of the debt which was sold. So where was it going to raise the necessary capital to develop the infrastructure? At the time, mm -hmm. um, Ghana Telecom's one-touch network um, had not even started rolling out 3G. But look mm -hmm. at the investment MTN and Vodafone have made in 3G and 4G. How is government going to raise those monies, whilst it also has uh, the attendant social um, dependencies from the population uh, on its budget. So it was the right decision that we took at the time. Look at even the other players. You're talking Glow, you're talking... Kasapa was backed by one of the biggest telecom companies in the world, Hutchison. And then um, Airtel Tigo. They are all finding it difficult to survive in this market, given the kind of competition that... 
MTN is leveraging its uh, multinational and uh, multinational uh, network mm -hmm. across the gl globe on. These entities, they play on stock markets the world over. You know? So they can raise the kind of money that they need to build the networks that becomes uh, very competitive. So if we had not sold uh, those shares to Vodafone, Ghana Telecom would have had to fold down the line. There was no way we could have sustained it. There was no way we could have sustained it. In my view, I don't think we could have. But it wasn't a bad thing. When we did a transaction, government further set aside $40 million to ensure that anybody inside Ghana Telecom that got um, affected by the transaction and had to be um, laid, off. laid off, got a good compensation okay. package from that amount. There, were, good, there were a few complaints here The good there. thing was that the business model that Vodafone brought, these mm -hmm. people who left GT mostly took their monies, got together from small entities, and Vodafone still farmed out their operations to them because mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the same kind of operation as Ghana Telecom had, uh, having all these kind of regional branches and all that. So power, cell towers, um, cell base stations, and the rest, were all given out to other entities. So they still got jobs, even though they are taking good compensation packages and left Ghana Telecom. So I think it was, was a good deal. So today, if you sit back and you watch how Vodafone is uh, performing, uh, will you be proud of yourself that I am very proud we of did myself a young man's job? The 30% the, the valuation of Vodafone today will be more than the 100% valuation of Ghana Telecom at the time that we, were, right. uh, we had to sell it. Mm. So I am proud that we, we, we did a transaction. And this was, don't forget, after we had taken a whooping $900 million out of the transaction. Well, well I, I mean, it was maybe today we'll look at it and say, oh, it was a good thing. But at some point, people also want to see what Ghana can do. What can Ghana do at all? Somebody put up a post on social media yesterday, and I saw it. And he was asking, so what does Ghana produce? Ghana produce a lot of things. What do we produce? Cocoa. We produce cocoa. Yes. What do we get from the cocoa? A lot of foreign exchange. Mm. Mm -hmm. You hear during the like exporting it in its raw form. Yeah, not not just now. Now the there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of processing going on. I know mm. of a lot of um, private sector entities that are now processing cocoa. We can do more. We can do better, and then we can do make better. more money. But that is why the government has also uh, started a drive on one D one F, which is open to private sector. They have a lot of raw material given the right kind of, um, if, if you follow the right kind of uh, procedures, you should be able to set up uh, a cocoa processing factory. The government will give you the necessary license to buy cocoa from the mm -hmm. uh, various um, you know, uh, cocoa marketing uh, company. They keep all kinds of stocks around the country. Yeah. And they sell some to the cocoa processing companies in the country to process. They don't export all of it. And Whilst we're in Parliament, you hear the uh, cocoa board come and ap apply for approval in Parliament to go and do syndicated loans. They can raise sometimes $1.8 billion, $2 billion, $1.5 and the rest. It all brings um, a lot of money into the country. We still have our gold, um, which by and large is a little loose in terms of our management of it as an asset because of the you you you, you appreciate the fact that we are not strong in whichever area we even find ourselves yes. even in cocoa yes. in minerals i mean uh uh what do you call it the uh the gold the diamond whatever we mine in the mining sector in the communication sector in almost every sector we are just giving it out because management is a problem Management is a problem. Well, I, you, I would you are say, hoping to become the general secretary of yeah. the party. Is I being the president of the Polka Party? You have a lot of uh, you know weight on your shoulder, um, even in the decision of who the party goes for in running as president. We just want to see how your agenda is going to look like to shape the whole party. Uh, sorry, the country. Country. Uh, you know, as a whole. And I and I agree, except to say that there are still a whole lot of areas where. Uh, we have Ghanaian champions leading industry. It is not, uh, it's not been always the case that uh, all these entities that we are talking about are led by foreigners. 
Um, do you know that even the Vodafone we talk about, the CEO is a yeah, Ghanaian. a Ghanaian. I employed Patricia first at Tigo when she left school. I was then an engineer at uh, Mobitel then. So I know she's full-blooded Ghanaian. Yeah. She trained at tech also. And she's a person that is um, managing um, Vodafone today. I think even MTN um, has had Ghanaian CEOs uh, for some time now. So you see, whereas uh, foreign capital has come in to make these entities be better, over the period, they, it is the Ghanaian people who are benefiting. Uh, apart from maybe uh, CU CFOs or so in some of these entities, or the management you find uh, currently done. And it's taking time to reach there because the investors also want to be sure that the Ghanaians who they will leave these things to manage have the necessary and requisite capacity. And I think yes, we've sir. taken time to build that capacity. And I hope that we do so in other areas as well. Uh, so that as we attract more and more uh, foreign investment, we can have our local champions manage these entities. Don't forget, we are part of the global market. And so we get affected by decisions of the bigger uh, market economies like the US, China, Russia. You know, we are all suffering today because of the effects of COVID, which is a global thing. And then the Russia-Ukraine conflict is affecting us. This morning I was watching a video which is on um, circulating on social media, media by the um, Singaporean uh, leader. And he talks about how his country, and we are in the same situation, can't do much about the global system because- Actually, almost all the countries. Yes, yeah. almost all the countries, because we are all at their mercy. So it is over time, as you're saying, we should build the necessary capacity. If we've been able to build our cocoa processing capacity to the level where, even if you don't come and buy our raw cocoa, we are not worried, then we can dictate the prices. Yeah. But now if you decide to I even collaborate with Cote d'Ivoire to try to determine world cocoa prices. And they tell you we are now synthesizing um, uh, chocolates. So we, we are no longer interested in your cocoa. What will we, will we do with all the cocoa that we, we, we produce? That's why we have to do everything to stop China from policing cocoa. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> that, that was just a whisper. So let's move into NPP as a political party. So you want to be the uh, general secretary, and you say that your, is it a theme? The theme is, uh, um, is it re-establishing the gr grassroots? Well, or something like that. Yes, um, the, the faith, restoring the, the faith, faith of, of the, the grassroots, grassroots yes. uh, in breaking the, the eight. Exactly. What does that mean? You, you've lost your grassroots? Well, we've been in power now for uh, about six years, and I have traveled around the country, and Sometimes you get a sense that there's some despondency setting in um, in the grassroots. Uh, it's not easy to give them back the necessary energy that they need. You know, every election we go to is like going to war, in quotes. Uh, you need your grassroots to properly energized. They have to be properly invigorated to go out there. They, have, they must have the conviction that we have to remain in power. And so, my campaign is about that. It's about restoring the hope, making sure that the energies that we went into 2016, uh, when we had to take a NDC out of office, the energies that were infused into the grassroots of the party, it is the same kind of energy that we will bring back into the grassroots going into um, 2024. If we are unable to do that, if we can't motivate the grassroots to have a new reason why they should fight to keep the party in power, they will have a challenge. So when you say grassroots for the NPP, who are these people you're targeting? Quite apart from your polling station and constituency officers who form the, the leadership of the grassroots, you're talking the rank and file of the party within the constituencies. If you go to a typical polling station, you have only five um, members of the leadership of the party there. But I dare say you may find in some constituencies 500 people at a polling station who, who are members of the MPP or supporters of the MPP or sympathizers. Mm -hmm. People who will give up something in support of the party, their time, their resources, people who will go out of their way to speak in support of the party. These are the people I'm talking about. 
in some smaller polling stations, maybe 50 people, maybe 20 people, but you find them all across the country. And that is the people that I'm referring to. What reason should that person sitting at Ntabia in the Suhum constituency today, who have been removed as, say, a polling station chairman in the last election, what reason should he have, Moses Amwako, to get up to go to the 2024 campaign and campaign for the MPP? That is the kind of person I'm talking about. That person who lost an election in 2018 and Nobody has gone to look for him again. And so he's sitting at home as if he's no longer part of the MP. Have you been looking for them? I have been looking for quite a number you of met them. Some? Anytime I met several people. And what did they say? They support the idea that I'm bringing. People are very happy that I want to um, talk for such people and encouraging them to come back. Are you, you know? one of those? Crossing the tsunamis in the primaries <laughs> in the MPP? <laughs> oh, not at all. I... Oh, because there's so much. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've, I've learned that uh, you, you, the retention rate is just about 30% now. Yeah, between 30-40%, I right. think. Yeah. So you're one of those? I am not um, preaching I any message. I saw you on a, on a newspaper this front page this morning yeah. as one of the uh, aspirants leading the polls. Yes, I've seen that as well. I, I haven't conducted any polls myself, well, and uh -huh. occasionally we see these things uh, pop up. But I have been out there speaking strongly um, for us to bring those people in. And um, on my tours, um, last time I, was, I went to do the declaration of intent in Takradi. Mm -hmm, Takradi. When I was coming back, I left my route around Mankasi and went all the way into the Asin enclave to go and visit Professor Phoebe mm. at home. And I don't think anybody had gone to his house in maybe years from, say, the party center to go and look for him. There's a former member of parliament, former minister of education, who um, can have an impact in the Asin South constituency. But nobody probably visits him. One time I went to visit the um, former local government minister during Kufo's administration, Honorable Ajayi Dako in uh, Sunyani. He was very happy when he saw me. So I heard I of an Obu Amir Kunfi yesterday. I was excited and yes. I was wondering, where are all these men? As I go around the country, I take my time and go and visit these people. They are not asking for anything from you. They are only asking to be included, to be involved. To be involved. That is what a lot of people are looking for. Not this idea of if you are uh, going to a conference, then you will send out a message that if you are, we don't want any intruders there. So if you are not uh, giving uh, delegate stack, don't show up there. Come on. If the MPP is holding uh, a conference, you think it's the NDC people who will come and get crashed? No. It is MPP people who want to feel included, mm -hmm. who will want to come. So don't let us even start off by describing them as intruders. Intruders. They are not intruding. It's there happened are... before in yes. the party? Yes. How did you feel about it? It is sad. When you read such things, because I'm no longer an MP, I'm not a delegate to these events, so it means that if I show up there, I'm an intruder. You're an intruder. And that is not right. Oh. When I talked about visiting Professor Fobi, you know, I stopped at uh, Aguna, uh, Asin and Professor Kumasi. Fobi, who lost his daughter yes. some years ago. Years ago in an accident, yes, uh, from the Legon. Uh, the Legon. Yes. Uh, Asin, Asin and Kumasi also, and in the market, I have branded water for my campaign. So the market women saw uh, the water. And you should see, I was surprised, saying that, is this our party that people are claiming we are unpopular in the marketplace? They were. It's not because it was bottled water that they were struggling for. It was because of the party label. So clearly, we are still a very popular party out there. Was your picture on it? Yes. And so when people see uh, our branding, they want to come around. So let us meet them with open arms, arms even if it's only to explain to them that, listen, I uh, asked for this um, a, a event, uh, you attend by uh, invitation, and also because of COVID, maybe we are trying to uh, reduce the number of people who will be in and out of this um, perimeter. People are reasonable, they will understand, but to really describe uh, your own party people who may want to come around because of an event, as intruders, it is not on. And it is some of that kind of language, which in my view, 
push people uh, away. You know, it, it makes you uh, spot the minors in the current leadership of the party? Well, the current leadership, I would say, have done their bit. But given the internal uh, situation of the party now and the external political factors that are playing, I think we need to have a different uh, kind of leadership style. And uh, even the approaches to how we do things must be different so that we can tolerate people better, we can include people better, and we can do things in a more open um, fashion rather than uh, what we saw, for instance, in the uh, polling station elections. You know, if you include people right from the polling station, somebody will advise you that there is a better way that you can uh, send your forms out there that will not result in people hiding forms, people fighting over forms, you know. But because of the whole closure of uh, the way secrecy. we do things, the secrecy, you know, as if if somebody knows that forms are even going out here, uh, the, the, it will create a problem. We are a party. Fundraising is part of our, uh, our, our responsibility. We need to raise funds. Everybody knows that the party needs money to function. So if you send 10,000 forms to whom for everybody who is interested to come and pick at a fee, even if these people want to come and buy MPP forms, let them buy. Let them buy. When we finish, we'll vet them and let them know mm -hmm. that. We know you, you are the NDC, so, so yeah, where were you 2016 and 2020? You can always vet them out. So there's no sense. There's uh, no, none in that kind of. Uh, depriving anybody from. Depriving buying. anybody. You can put it online, let people download, and when they are submitting, let them pay their, their fees and let your vetting processes be strong. So if you open up, if you include people, you will get all the ideas, the right ideas that will help the party shape its own future. In any case, I always say party is about numbers. It's about numbers. So even if NDC people will pick your forms, you're welcome. You're welcome. As long so. as our leadership and delegates know that this is an NDC person and uh, there's a process by which, haven't we had NDC people become MPP yeah. before? Eventually. Eventually. The late Honorable Peter Yafi Pepra. Mm -hmm. Under mm -hmm. President Rawlings, he was a deputy minister of trade. He became an MPP MP yeah. in Abetifi. Um, Honorable Kofi Asante, who left GIFEC recently, and congrats to him, he's recently been ordained a pastor, was an NDC MP in the Amenfi area. The chairman of our party, Eddie Blay, when I went to parliament first, he was a deputy was speaker, and he was a CPP MP. CPP. Examples abound. But of course, there are processes by which these people who may have moved from another political party into our party will go through for us to accept them to become members or even hold positions in the party. But well, like you rightly said, we are a party and we win by numbers. So we should do everything to let people feel included, to be more open and more tolerant to views within the party. We're having an interaction with uh, Frederick Oparians, a former honorable member of parliament uh, from the fourth to the seventh um, parliament. And he's played a number of roles in our corporate environment as well. He's been a deputy minister for communication as well, so many things. And when we come back from this break, we'll ask him what new he's bringing on board the MPP. Welcome back uh, to Good Afternoon Ghana. Uh, I have a couple of messages. Let me try and capture them before I go back to him. Almost all aspirants, it's only Honorable Frederick Oparianza who saw what it takes to lead the MPP to break the eight. <laughs> That is restoring the grassroots, I guess. This is from Adan Kennedy of Suhum. So, uh, good afternoon, Annie. I think he's a man of vast experience and expertise. He make a, he'll make a better general secretary as compared to the competitors. It baffles me that such a man with enormous expertise in the telecom sector will be sidelined from the management of this sector. I think he will equally make a better communications minister as well. Yeah, he speaks well. Uh, if I were a delegate, he... Uh, delegate, no two ways about 
me going for honorable appearance, so he will be the best general secretary uh, to work for the MPP from NTO in Daomango, Savannah region. Good afternoon, Nani. Please tell honorable that the Gushegu constituency secretary wants to speak with him seriously. Well, I'll deal with that later uh, about these numbers that I give out. It's not going to happen now. Good afternoon, Annie. The sale of Ghana Telecom now Vodafone by the SOR President uh, Kufu administration was a defeated sale out uh, and its associated and purported kickbacks <laughs> which surrounded any uh, grammatical, uh, uh, grammatical explanation. David A. Dutema, West Constituency, send that in. Hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Elisha, Elisha, or say he is truly an answer to the current situation. Strong man for General Secretary. Honorable, I'm so happy your vision and your well thought about, about the MPP, MPP. In fact, you really made me feel happy uh, as an MPP member. Good afternoon, Metro TV. Honorable Paransa has the ability to inspire uh, volunteerism and build coalition. His politics astuteness uh, has not only humbled him to be resourceful and results oriented but also uh reposted okay repo reposited in him quality leadership prowess now um in him we have a competent ceo of a great elephant <laughs> fraternity answer is the answer Frederick of I think you have to adopt that. Answer is the answer. <laughs> it's nightmare. Part of my hashtags. Uh, it's part of your hashtag, hashtags. Okay. This is uh, Austin sending, sending that in. Okay. Let me just wrap up with you. But let me come to you. So, what are your new plans for the party as a CEO or as a general secretary? Well, it's, it will take more than the time we have on this show to talk about it. But I'll just touch briefly on it. I already talked about the need for us to be a bit more tolerant, to include everybody, and also to be a little bit more open to each other in how we do uh, the things we do. We are going to have to forge new relationships and even deepen existing ones between our party and other actors, CSOs, the Electoral Commission, yourselves, the media. We need to redefine how we relate to all these entities, our um, academia, the traditional leadership, the religious leaders, we will need to um, redefine our relationships, deepen existing ones and forge new ones. It's very, very important. What uh, do you important. make of vigilantes and politicians? Well, that was one of the uh, very bold decisions which uh, Nanado uh, has taken in outlawing vigilantism. Um, I know it's been outlawed by law, but um, just as any other um, crime. Thanks for your admission. Even when um, it has been outlawed by law, you would always find some uh, recalcitrant characters who would still try to. But that is where we need to ask our police to be very uh, firm in protecting the laws. In going about my campaign, I have approached the police to ask them for help to give my team protection. Mm -hmm. That is what it ought to be. Um, previously, because I may be thinking that somebody may have boys to attack me, I would also have gone out to go and look out for boys to accompany me so that if I get attacked, they could defend me. Mm -hmm. But now it is outlawed. So I've written a letter to the IGP asking for some detachment of uh, policemen to escort my, my campaign team. We are going to go around the whole country at all kinds of hours. You know? So it has nothing to do with vigilante boys? No, no, I don't have any You don't have um, vigilante body. boys? No, I don't have You're any. You're sure? 100%. I can cross my heart on that. Yeah. What will you do to cease your party from using vigilante boys? Well, since the um, passage of that law, I have not really seen um, a party in that sense um, having that kind of uh, entertainment for vigilantes. I haven't seen that. Uh, if you have seen some in and around some party event, uh, it may not be uh, formally sanctioned by the party. It may be some over-enthusiastic young men who think that they want to still play that kind of role. It would, like I said, it would take time to Yeah, but we saw the exposés of that. the IOS yeah. West Wagon Committee and its recommendations, but that we, didn't, we didn't see any action uh, considering the fact that there were people who were in the national security hoping that uh, what the committee recommends that they should be taken out of the, you know, the security. Well, I, I believe it was all part of what led to the... Uh, proposals from the presidency 
to Parliament and the subsequent passage of the law. So action has been um, taken. Um, I am also of the firm belief, as I have heard others say, that this thing has gone on over years. Okay, you can trace it as far back as when we were in opposition in Tripoli. We had somebody shoot guns there in Tripoli. I was part of the team which uh, took videos of him and submitted this to national security. What happened? So if you want to resolve these matters, then you're going to have to uh, take all, all those issues and try to pin everybody down and trace them and punish them. And I believe that is why the president in his wisdom said, okay, first, let us put a formal law banning vigilantism. Then after that, whoever gets involved in vigilantism, we can go after them and there will be a law to prosecute. You know, sometimes the courts are funny. Um, something that you and I would think every day that this is wrong, you would take somebody and you have no laws to prosecute them by. Right. But by um, enacting the uh, vigilantism, anti-vigilantism act, it means there is now law uh, against mm -hmm. them. There's legal basis for the police. Um, you know, if you tinted your car glasses, uh, the police can't really arrest you. I don't know if there's a new law against it. Previously, yes. they would tell you, why is your glass so dark? Yeah. Low white, let me see inside. But there was never really any law against tinted yeah. glasses. And so if they wanted to arrest people for having tinted glasses, then they would need to go to parliament to have parliament pass a law to stop citizens from tinting their vehicle glasses. But you would think that this car is too dark. There's something wrong with it. You know, so it's important that uh, we not only go by the things we think are wrong, but we make laws. And for that, I commend Anado's administration for being bold to come out and make a law against vigilantism. In you know politics. the former MP for Wale Wale? He didn't mention his name. I'm, I have to check. Okay. Because uh, he sent his number. He said he's a friend. You, you have to call him, but we will check first. Okay. Like I said, all these numbers, this one day, I myself <laughs> will personally assist him to do that. <laughs> so I'm um, fairly from Agape. People at Ablekuma uh, are angry with the MPP government and we're disappointed. MP, come and see our road. Very bad. Ghanaians are very happy to hear something good from him. Um, and we're going to support or do or die. No, I don't want to say that. Please give me his number. No, I'll deal with that later. So to be able to break the eight, we need experienced politicians like Honorable Parians. That is from Molanyo Achim Tafu. Thank you for your thoughts uh, about us. Okay, thank you for your thought about us. The list, uh, the, the list of us, or you want to write the list maybe? Mm, okay, my time is up. So what are your last words before you go? Well, I am saying that I will be going around the country to go and talk to delegates, and I would urge them to, at this point, look at all the aspirants who are coming. You shouldn't see us as coming to take somebody off a certain seat, no. Um, for every election, you're weighing all of us and putting us on a pedestal and uh, trying to find out who best fits the profile for the kind of... Uh, leader Issue. that the party needs, looking at what confronts the party in 2024. And as some uh, colleagues of mine in the Coas Parliament, the French people told me... Did you learn they, French? Well, they told me answer has the answers. So I believe that my party people will agree that indeed, judging by the small that time that I've had to share some of my uh, views and vision, uh, they do believe that answer do indeed have the answers. Well, so Fred, Frederick Oparianza has been our guest uh, vying for the general secretaryship of the party, the NPP. Uh, you want to follow his activities and see if you're a delegate, you will give him your vote. Answer has the answer. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon to you.